Hello, welcome to Require Viewing Trends and Current Events. It's a public affairs show here at IPFW brought to you by the American Democracy Project as well as the Departments of History and Political Science. It's also made available through CATV, and we like to thank the folks at CATV for recording it and broadcasting it. We also like to thank the Helmke Library for making it available on MDON. My name is Andy Downs. I'm a member of the Political Science Department here, and joining me as always is the co-host Ann Livshiz from the Department of History. And also joining us in the studio today is Mike Wolf from the Department of Political Science. And what's today's topic? Well, um, in March, IPFW was fortunate enough to host Diane Ravitch, a renowned education historian, as an omnibus speaker. And one of the interesting topics that she raised uh, was the issue of comparative analysis of different countries' educational systems. Um, not surprisingly, a country that gets mentioned a lot in this context, um, in comparison to the United States, is China. Um, and given more general anxieties in the United States about our ability to compete with China economically, the question that can be asked is, are we behind China when it comes to educational development, and in particular, educational opportunities? Opportunities. Now, we should say before we go any further that, of course, the, the fearsome Chinese educational system that we, that, we, that we tend to think about is a relatively recent development. This is a post-1976, post-cultural revolution development. Um, where the regime very consciously moved away from the view that ideology trumps expertise and, and therefore the educational system um, is, is only important so far as it indoctrinates people and, a, uh, and made a conscious effort towards investing in more traditional education in order to promote modernization um, and economic development, investing in, um, in uh, research and development um, and really sort of becoming emerging as an economic superpower um, and one that sort of that raises questions and concerns. And so fortunately um, in our discussion uh, today of the Chinese educational system, we do have an expert here on campus, um, Dr. Shina Choi um, in the Department of Education. Her primary focus is the Korean educational system, but she is also somebody who has studied the Chinese educational system. Um, and so we were able to ask her a few questions. And so the first question that we asked her was, um, what, are, what is the percentage of Chinese K through 12 students who are able to go on to higher education, and what keeps that percentage from going higher? Let's listen to what she said. Sure. Uh, approximately 26% uh, of uh, Chinese high school uh, graduates are entering into higher education. Uh, Chinese education has been expanded so much in one decade about uh, uh, triple the size of it. So there is uh, uh, many problems associated with it. Uh, funding, so one of the things that the, uh, keeps uh, higher education market expanding uh, further and also quality control expanding so fast so much, uh, and also the other thing is uh, how to find a job for these uh, graduates. So those are the, the elements that keeps from growing. I said that earlier, it's about 26% of high, uh, high school graduates entering into college, but we have to take into consideration that the, uh, uh, there is a great disparity between urban area and rural area. In some rich urban areas such as uh, Shanghai or Beijing, some uh, more than 80% of high school graduates are entering into college, whereas uh, some rural er areas, uh, as far as nine years of compulsory education is as far as many students entering into, so zero percent. That's several interesting things there. One of the things that struck me, though, was the difference between those who are living in an urban environment versus rural environment and, and the expectation or actually going to college, which I found to be quite fascinating. The other interesting thing is that we see, even though we're talking, um, there are some really interesting similarities and differences with our educational system. Um, the concerns about resources, the, the quick growth and issues of funding and quality control and, of course, jobs for graduates versus the fact that it's still only 26 percent of high school students, whereas, of course, we see a very, very different pattern in the United States right now. Yeah, and, and interestingly, when you talk about education policy in the United States, we hear the same things as you mentioned. What are graduation rates? How do we get people in? But I think the expectation of what the government is supposed to do in, in getting people through is a little bit different. Uh, Mike, you've been a faculty member here at IPFW for quite some time. When students are coming into your class, do they represent a fairly broad spectrum of, uh, of, the, the, of the society around here at IPFW? Yeah, I think uh, as we've grown, and as the population has changed, we've uh, certainly seen kind of a, a broadening of the experience of the students. Mm -hmm. And it's been helpful. They help each other. I mean, we've demonstrated that throughout our history into trying to create the university as a place that is open to all because it's not just who can gain from it, but also the experiences that they can share with each other to kind of further the liberal arts experience of people. 
Yeah, we do have a lot of people who are non-traditional students still, folks who are not 18, 19, 20, 21 year old students. And when they're here, they do bring in life experiences mm -hmm. that, the, that the younger students don't necessarily have. I know one of the first classes I ever taught, there was a student in the back of the room who was a traditional student, one in the front of the room who was non-traditional. And uh, you, I mean, you could just sort of see the pattern developing already. The one in the back was doing the stuff that the one in the front had done 15 or 20 years earlier. Absolutely. Which is, which is an interesting experience at a place like IPFW since right. we're basically an open enrollment institution. Right. And of course it raises questions about, you know, what is the goal of education? Is the goal of education to, to produce, you know, X number of qualified individuals who are going to go into the job market? And if so, uh, then perhaps there's a more efficient way of culling that percentage, right? Uh, versus, you know, is this an opportunity that we want to provide to as many people as possible? And then perhaps it shouldn't be just the emphasis on, you know, urban versus rural, but providing opportunities for as many people who want those opportunities as possible. Yeah, we do hear people when they're talking ed, ed policy talk in a broader sense, not just uh, a traditional four-year institution, but trade schools and other programs as well. So it's not just coming to the university, but it's being engaged in, in some sort of learning beyond high school. One of the things that a lot of people will talk about when they're talking about education in other countries is the fact that some people know very early on they will be going to college. You take a test at a certain age, therefore you get to go to college or you don't get to go to college. Some, some countries it's very difficult to get into college or university if you made it into the wrong track, even though 40 years later or 10 years later you maybe have turned your life around. So one of the things we did ask Sheena was, when do the students in China know they will be going to college and how does their educational experience differ from the folks who are not going to be going to college? So let's hear from Sheena again. I think for some students, they already know when they, uh, when they choose the high school. Uh, some students choose a vocational uh, high school. Those students are uh, entering into labor market after graduation. And the, uh, those students who enter into academic track of a high school, uh, in half of the, uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, high school experience, they kind of know which school they will be entering into through their mock test or uh, class standing. If they are above the average, they will know some kind of college they will be attending. Well, and this issue of tracking that you mentioned earlier and that, and that Sheena is referring to is a really, really interesting one because, again, um, the, the, the question of when, is it, when do you decide a, a young person's future? How early do you know? And I mean, so, so often in, in, you meet so many students, especially here at IPFW, who may not have gone to the best high schools, who may not have um, come from a family where anybody has gone to college, who really sort of come to IPFW and discover a love for learning and, and all these different things that they simply previously were not exposed to. If determinations are made before they get to college, um, many of them would never have a chance to experience those. And frankly, we would lose so much of what they could provide you know, to, to the university university setting, but certainly to society as a whole. And these are decisions that are made. Um, I mean, we see this this happen, I mean, again, as a Soviet historian, of course, we see that happen, in the, saw that happen in the Soviet Union as well, that the state has to decide how to allocate scarce resources, access to higher education as a scarce resource, and it has to make an investment that benefits society as a whole, which is to invest in the people who are sure things, rather than, you know, mm -hmm. who knows what might happen. Well, and it's even uh, other advanced industrial democracies uh, track students early on, they decide and make decisions that in the United States our political culture simply wouldn't allow people. I mean, uh, if a fourth grade teacher came to us and said, your, uh, your child is going on some track, I think they would probably get punched in the nose rather than <laughs> kind of accept it as a process. Right. Uh, so I, I, I was, it was interesting, I was reading a, a number of Chronicle of Higher Education articles about China and about students wanting to, to come to the United States. And there's a cottage industry that has grown. That it, it has some elements that are somewhat sketchy about um, meeting the criteria and it's it's very interesting that the, the demand has surged so great for for exchange to the United States that it's almost beyond an ability for them to track and to come with any kind of regulatory way to deal with it. Yeah, but it is a scarce resource how do you make the decision about who gets to access the scarce resource or not as I mentioned earlier IPFW is basically an open enrollment institution so we're pretty much going to let everybody come in, but in a place like China, where it is a, it's still very much in a, in a growth, and in fact, some might argue painful growth stage, how do they decide who's going to get to go where? And maybe, maybe the decisions are made a little too early in some instances, maybe not. 
But you got to do what you got to do. And that's perhaps where some standardized tests, you know, uh, could be used um, in a way. And this is actually the next question that we had for, uh, for Sheena. We wanted to ask her, kind of get into the comparison between the United States and China. And in particular, of course, it's difficult to compare test scores and performance mm -hmm. across cultures. But how do college-bound Chinese students compare to college-bound students in the United States? Let's hear what she said. Um, well, for international strand strand standardized test, of course, uh, we know that Chinese students perform better. But the other thing is that the uh, college, uh, high school life itself is a uh, pretty different uh, because they take they take a uh, uh, test seriously many students have to prepare the exam many of them a uh, lot memorization uh, based upon uh, potential test questions so uh, uh, unlike American high school students not many of them engaging in uh, extracurricular activities I was talking with Sheena off camera while we were recording this and one of the things I found interesting was that she said that uh, for some students, when they are preparing for the exam, the idea to actually be involved in a, an exchange program, for example, to come to the United States or any other country, is not something that's going to happen because their life is preparing for that exam. Huh. Different than the United States. <laughs> and also, I think, you know, when we talk about the population, the potential college population in the United States, the pool of who's measured, might not accurately compare with other countries who might it's in tracking. Uh, so I think it's a big point. And that's, I, I think that, that's, a, that's a really, really important point because we, we certainly allow more people to take, <laughs> to take these tests. I mean, the other really interesting thing that I find about the standardized test is that, on the one hand, this is one of the things that drives that fear, that we're not doing as well as China because they do better than us on standardized tests. But one of the things that we see now is that there's a move, at least in some Chinese universities, to actually move away from standardized testing um, and instead promote liberal arts education because they feel that memorization is great for certain things, but ultimately that is not, you, if you want creative people, this is not how you're going to get them. So at a time when liberal arts is really under attack as being not useful enough in the United States, we see China actually embracing it as a way to propel their society forward um, in order to make sure that they're not just a society of really good rule followers and, and memorizers, but that there's something more um, going on propelling society forward. Yeah, and China's not the only country where there's a potential move away from tests or at least a reconception of what the test would be. Uh, and some of those are countries the United States has actually even looked to. Well, we're very lucky in that, Mike, you've actually been over to, to mm -hmm. China recently, and you'll be going back again uh, relatively really soon. Quick. As I re yeah, really <laughs> quickly. Uh, so, and in fact, by the time people see this, you, you will have been already. I'm what thinking was, about them. Yeah, <laughs> what was the purpose uh, of, of the first trip? Well, uh, it was really trying to also include social scientists. I mean, the chancellor and uh, the vice chancellor, of, uh, assistant vice chancellor of academic affairs, try to come up with growing this out. It's very easy to, in, with China, have business school exchanges, scientific exchanges, and engineering exchanges. It's quite a different thing to develop kind of more social scientific and humani uh, humanities exchanges because, uh, you, you know, these are areas that aren't necessarily, as uh, Dr. Choi was talking about, the jobs, you know, there's a, such a concentration even in the United States right now, concentrating on the, the STEM programs and all these. But the arts and sciences, I would think, are very important for a considerable portion of what we do and who we are as citizens. So these type of exchanges are just as important, but they are not easily turnkey. And so you have to really work on them. And that's what we're trying to do between this trip and uh, the past trip is to further cement some relationships between us so that uh, we can build on the real traction we've had in these other programs to include liberal arts exchanges, include humanities changes, exchanges, both for the benefit of our students, for our faculty, and for their students. And this does echo what Ann mentioned a moment ago about the Chinese government saying that perhaps education needs to uh, concentrate a little less on memorization. But, but these are not without some sort of merit either. I mean, when, when you talk about social scientists going over, mm -hmm. there are legitimate discussions for you to have with people about the structure of government and service delivery within, uh, within for public goods, garbage collection, uh, yeah. street cleaning, those sorts of things as well. Yeah, and the, the topics are different. I mean, political science is a different discipline here than it is there. <laughs> And so uh, I, uh, we, you know, those are constraints on the system. So too, by the way, are constraints on uh, the, the, the level our students are able to exchange. We have to increase the uh, instruction in Chinese history, Chinese politics, and Chinese language to really be able to take advantage of these opportunities. And it would be yeah. great if we could see that happen at IPFW Absolutely. to meet, to, you know, to, to go along with the, the broader internationalization. Well, and of course, I think that we're very lucky to have the social sciences and arts and sciences represented by 
Professor Wolf over in China. Yeah, and we should mention quickly, you can take a couple of years of Chinese here as well as Arabic. So I mean, the, the, it's not like it's not like IPFW is, is starting from no. ground zero. No, we have Professor Maggie Gu is doing a tremendous yeah. job training people. Not so much Chinese history yet, but we're hoping. <laughs> yes, that's the next step. <laughs> If they're listening. <laughs> so, so obviously some people are going to be a little skeptical that when you went uh, abroad, you got to see the best of what there was to see. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to see real life. Did you get any perspective uh, or perception that you were maybe being shown preferential treatment and seeing the good and not the bad? Well, it's hard when you go to the universities not to see the good because the growth is astronomical. We were at a 10-year-old university, Hangs Out Normal, who is now building a new entire university because of the growth talked about. But on the way back to the train station, we actually took a back route, and we really saw the scale of how things are working in China, and particularly industrial, small industrialized kind of production. It was amazing to see uh, just how uh, strong things are developing. This, uh, you know, the size of small shops where you would see, you know. Uh, sewing machines stacked five tall across a whole shop and then the next door was a sewing repair shop. I mean, <laughs> it was just the scale of things is astronomical and the size of the economy. And it wasn't kind of fancy and it wasn't uh, something that uh, would make you quake in your boots or something as many Americans do, but does show the uh, difference of where the American economy is and where the Chinese economy is. But it's reassuring that we are in a market relationship and it's, we, people forget this. Uh, there's a real fear about China right now, but to remember these are the kind of binds that, uh, that, that are supposed to be positive, you know, as we turn to intellectual exchanges. Well, one other question that we, uh, that we had a chance to ask Sheena was um, the value what, um, of these educational um, uh, exchange programs, right? What are the advantages from the educational point of view? Let's hear what she said. Oh, I see. Uh, lots of potential, lots of a positive side of our international exchange program. I think one thing, personally, students can gain broader experience. They can broaden their uh, world view uh, and uh, through their experience. But uh, society can also benefit by improve the uh, international understanding. Uh, you know, I really found that interesting when she was talking about what we could gain from this, not only from the student perspective, but also from the adult perspective, people who, uh, who can interact right away. Uh, we did ask her, though, if there were some disadvantages to exchange programs, and the clip was so short, we're not going to show it, because all she said was, no, can't think of any. <laughs> uh, but, but Anne, that's not, a, that's not a, a position held by everybody. Well, I mean, there's, there are obviously, I mean, we operate in the assumption that, that by the more we learn about other cultures and we're exposed to them, uh, we are, um, the better off things are going to be. But one of the things that comes up in higher education now is how do we know? Um, do, we, how, do we have to figure out some way to measure what are the concrete ways in which students benefit from these kinds of exchanges? Um, just with so many other things, you know, do we just believe on faith that this is better or do we actually have to measure it somehow? Um, if, if we think about kind of more connected to, to us, I mean, the, the question for Mike would be, um, what, what, can the, what should the people of Northeast Indiana expect to gain out of this growing relationship between IPFW and higher education institutions in China? Well, clearly, I mean, I think on this very issue to talk about, the whole is greater than some of its parts. We can tick a bunch of small kind of exchange economic benefits and everything. But the whole is greater. I mean, we are going to produce uh, more well-rounded students with these exchanges. But there are clear economic benefits to having uh, people trained in what Chinese society and China in the trades themselves and how they work there. So it's tremendously important both functionally for our understanding of China for right now, but also for our students in our general area to know more about the world and be leaders. Yeah, we have, a lot of people think of China as this thing that's coming to do in our economy. There are a couple of people over there who might be interested in buying our products as well. Absolutely, and uh, they're investing us. Yeah, they're underwriting our debt, but uh, they're, they're investing that we're going to be able to pay that off in 30 years. I think that's a good sign of what their view of the United States is. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, thank you very much for joining us, and, and good luck on the trip. Thanks for going on the first trip. Good luck on sure. the next trip, and when you okay. come back, I'm sure you'll have uh, some very interesting things for us to hear. Excellent. So well, thank you. we will be back in just a couple of seconds. IPFW, Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne, your graduate university.
as is our custom, we like to provide you with some recommended readings um, if you wanted to find out more about the topics that we discussed earlier in the show. Um, the first is Radicalism and Education Reform in 20th Century China, The Search for an Ideal Development Model by Suzanne Pepper from 2000 by Cambridge University Press. Another interesting book, Education, Culture, and Identity in 20th Century China. This is an edited volume from 2001 um, dealing with the different aspects of uh, Chinese educational system over the century. Um, another interesting book, Internationalization of Higher Education in the Era of Globalization, What Have Been Its Implications in China and Japan, uh, by Fu Tao Wang uh, from 2007. Um, an interesting publication, again, emphasizing the comparative approach. Um, another, uh, another book, um, China's Higher Education Reform and Internationalization. Um, this is another edited volume by Jeanette, uh, by Jeanette Ryan from 2011. And finally, Student Loans in China, Efficiency, Equity, and Social Justice by Bei Wang Cheng from 2011, um, something that really resonates, I think, with a lot of people uh, thinking about higher education in the United States. Oh, goodness knows, education is not inexpensive, so uh, <laughs> a lot of people end up with loans. We do have a couple of more things to show you coming up on the screen right now. Uh, the next one is Education in China, the Chinese Perspective. This is actually available in English. Once again, Education in China, the Chinese Perspective. Uh, this is an electronic journal. It's available through IUCAT, so if those of you who are uh, students at IPFW, you can check it out, or if you're a taxpayer, you can get access to IUCAT as well. Next up is Education in China, the U.S. Perspective, obviously taking a slightly different approach to things. And this is available through uh, a publication that people in the world of academia read a lot. It's called The Chronicle of Higher Education. In fact, Mike mentioned it. So you can go to www.chronicle.com. That's Education in China, the U.S. Perspective. And then finally, something available through OECD. Uh, OECD, if people were, were uh, looking at the screen carefully or if they've looked up the books that you mentioned, they probably noticed this was a publisher of at least one of them. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, it is a wonderful place to find comparative information, not just on education, but on a whole lot of stuff. And so uh, we really do recommend to people that they check out those additional sources. Every, in every episode of Required Viewing, we turn the faculty spotlight on to somebody. And this, this time, what we're going to do is actually turn it on to the person who runs IPFW. We're going to turn it on Chancellor Wartell, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the exchange program we have going with China. One of our major missions as a university for our students is developing an international environment here at IPFW. And, and whether that means sending our students to other countries or bringing students from other countries here, both of those are important. Our relationships in China are especially important to us because China is becoming much more of a world power than it ever has been before. And we're developing relationships with Chinese universities that not only allow our students to go there and their students to come here, but our faculty to become involved in research projects in China, as well as Chinese uh, professors to come over here, become involved with our research projects, and learn to teach courses in English, which is becoming an important goal of their universities. The most important research project that we're involved in right now has to do with pandas and perpetuating the species. Uh, pandas are a, uh, an endangered species, and we're involved with the Panda Institute for Reproductive Studies in Chengdu. In fact, Professor Frank Palladino is doing studies for them which help to introduce farm-raised pandas into the wild. And, and this is a very important project because it turns out that uh, pandas uh, which are farm-raised are reintroduced into the wild and the wild pandas kill them. So Frank is figuring out ways that that shouldn't happen. We're we have developed um, relationships with more than a dozen Chinese universities, and the opportunities for students and faculty are growing. It's an exciting and wonderful part of an education at IPFW. It really is great stuff that we're talking about right here. And what I like about this one, you know, Mike was in the studio. We talked about how it's good for students, it's good for business folks. But this is really good for us academically, too, where folks like Frank Palladino can go to China and share knowledge, and we can actually gain knowledge from them as well. 
Absolutely, and I'm really excited about the expansion of opportunities for our students. So many of our students, and we, and we talked about this in the beginning of the show, um, that, that this is a, the, our student body reflects the, the sort of the diversity of the, of the local population, and it's great to see students who would not have had these opportunities before without IPFW get opportunities to go and study abroad, whether they're involved in these kinds of research projects or whether they're simply taking classes um, in Chinese universities. Yeah, we always close the show by talking a little bit about some things that we expect to come up in the near future, things that you might want to watch for. And the first one for me, of course, is the primary election that's coming up. There actually are some local races that are exciting, and perhaps the thing that most people will focus on is actually the Senate race, and that being the Republican nomination between uh, Dick Luger and Richard Murdoch. Um, actually, mine is elections as well, but not in the United States, although that's fascinating, of course. Um, but elections in two in two places. The first place is the elections in Burma. Um, one of the really interesting things that we're seeing is that the National League for Democracy actually winning seats in this election. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not that is actually going to lead to democratization in the country um, or not. What else do you have on your list? Uh, my other one is elections in Russia. I know that we already had a show on the elections in Russia, uh, focusing on the inevitability of Putin's um, uh, election. But one thing that we're seeing now is that in, that opposition parties actually are doing pretty okay in local elections. Um, and so that di the, sort of the confrontation between local leaders um, and the central government is going to be really interesting to see in the in the coming years. You know, it is interesting. You often start out well at the local level and you build up to the upper level. And I know there's some people who think I'm a little biased about local politics, but what the heck I am. And the last one for me, of course, is that spring uh, training is over. We have baseball beginning, and that means that summer is uh, here for all of us to enjoy. Well, thank you very much for joining us for Required Viewing Trends and Current Events. This is a public affairs show here at IPFW. It's brought to you by the American Democracy Project, as well as the Departments of History and Political Science. It is recorded at CATV and made available on CATV as well as through the Helmkey Library. This is Ann Livshiz. I'm Andy Downs. Thank you very much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time.